Hi guys, um, great to see you all again. Hi Erica, and hey. welcome to our, our third Marketing 101 for Startup session. And today we're going to discuss a, a whole guide to branding and how to build a brand strategy, which is a very hot topic when it comes to startups. Um, I'm extremely excited not only to introduce Erica, but to tell you that um, Erica is a great she's a close friend. And um, I'm extremely happy that she's doing this session with us, not because only uh, she's a friend and she has so many years of experience that she can uh, tell you everything about uh, uh, branding, but because I, when we decided to do the session, Erica works at uh, LFBC, which we'll tell you about. And a lot of you will probably ask, like, why is she doing it with another VC? And I think that there's an extremely added value here where two VCs um, are, are looking at this subject and giving uh, their added advice to startups um, uh, and, and looking at it and giving and giving added, our added value from that perspective, something which you won't necessarily get if we do it with just, let's like, say, a service provider. Um, so it's a different kind of session. It's going to be a Q&A session. We're not going to have a presentation. Um, we're going to just discuss the topic that uh, we'll bring in one of our portfolio companies uh, at the end. Um, so before we get into things, a um, few things about Erica. I'm here to embarrass her a little bit. Uh, for those who don't know Erica, she's a crazy Miami Dolphins fan. I'm a British, so I do the soccer, she does the football. Um, she's addicted to ice cream, which is good, except she loves chocolate chip, mint chocolate chip. Uh, so she's definitely American. Um, Cause you can't really find it so much in Israel. <laughs> and she loves to rap and hip hop. Um, maybe you can rap and hip hop the session if you want. Yeah, that's uh, the plan. I'm gonna sing everything all the way through. That's great. That will definitely, you know, bring in more people to view. Um, so now that you know the interesting juicy things about Erica, um, um, and if you could little, tell us a little bit more about yourself. So thank you, Yael. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Um, I always like chatting with you. Um, so, okay, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, first of all, as a former journalist, I'm usually the one asking the questions and doing the interviewing. So I'll, I'll try my best to be a good subject here. Um, I grew up uh, in a small town in the States in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I uh, graduated from NYU with a degree in journalism, and then I decided to make Aliyah. I, I'm living here now, married with three little boys who like to keep me on my toes. Uh, and my professional background is actually not in high tech or startups. I worked as a journalist for 15 years, primarily for the BBC, um, writing, producing, filming and editing news and feature stories. Uh, on everything from politics and conflicts to technology, religion, culture, human interest stories, both here in Israel and abroad. And it was an awesome journey and a, a real privilege. You know, I had the opportunity to meet so many people and tell their incredible stories to the world. And I felt like I really met new people and learned something new every single day. And I'm, I'm so grateful to have worked for one of, you know, the, the best media corporations in the world. And then about two and a half years ago, I met Michael Eisenberg and I heard about Olive and I was offered a new opportunity to keep learning and growing. And I transitioned into this dynamic and exciting world of, uh, you know, Israeli venture capital and startups. We, we started actually at the same time, I remember. We started like two and a half years ago. I think we really started at the same month. And uh, it's, you know, it's amazing to see how the market dynamics have changed. I mean, it's just it's incredible. Um, so... Aleph is it's one of the top VCs in Israel and they have a very unique approach um, where I'd like for you to tell us about where you have this whole added value service that you give to your portfolio uh, companies. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about this approach? Yeah, I'll, I'll give a little bit of background about Aleph. So Aleph is an early stage venture capital fund. Um, we're focused on partnering with great Israeli entrepreneurs to build large, meaningful companies and impactful global brands. It was founded in 2013, and it's a partnership of Michael Eisenberg, Eden Shochat, Yael Elad, Aaron Rosenson, and Tomer Diari, with about $550 million under management. We've invested in more than 50 portfolio companies, including Lemonade, Melio, Healthy, Joytunes, Fabric, Honeybook, Bring. And we, we do have a really unique approach to servicing the hell out of our entrepreneurs, as we like to say at Aleph. We actually built a startup within our fund called Amplify, the Olive Value Generator, uh, to tackle the greatest startup challenges that all of our companies are facing, like talent recruitment, business development, follow-on funding at scale. So Amplify is basically a platform that leverages our global network to provide value tools and services to our portfolio companies and the entire Israeli high-tech ecosystem. 
you know, at all of, we, we, we truly believe that all of our portfolio companies are power multipliers for each other. And every company that joins our community is amplified by the power of our combined networks. So my role at Olive is very dynamic. On the one hand, um, uh, like you, I'm leading all of the marketing, I'm managing our brand and our content and activities and initiatives. And on the other hand, I'm working really closely with our portfolio companies to use my background as a journalist to help them tell their stories to the world. I work with our founders, I work with our marketing teams on everything from storytelling and messaging to content strategy and creation, brand building, and developing and implementing media and PR strategies. And I, I really love being able to use the skills that I acquired as a journalist, what makes a story, how to tell a story in a compelling way, how to connect and engage with people around the world, uh, and yeah, I'm really inspired, you know, uh, every day by this sense of mission and passion that's inherent to the Israeli hijack ecosystem. And very grateful to have this tiny part to play as these entrepreneurs and startups are, are shaping the future. It's a big part, it's not a tiny part. And um, it's great to see how you and the VCs and also I do it in my role, we really help companies build their story from the beginning of how they, you know, tell it to the world. But but I think let's if we if we want to like get a little bit more now into branding, I think you, there's a lot of focus on branding um, and storytelling, especially at the very, very beginning. Um, and many times the story changes so much if it's when you have your first customers or you know the features change. And a lot of times founders tell me they're like, well why do we need to do branding like now? Let's wait a bit. Let's wait so we have a little bit more understanding of of our first customers and what, what their needs are and and, and et cetera and et cetera. And I think it's really important to understand the big, to do it at the beginning. And I'd like for you to discuss that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we believe, and Olive, since its inception, has always stressed to founders the importance of, of building a meaningful and impactful brand. Brand is how you identify yourself and differentiate yourself. It's key to connecting in a meaningful way to the people of the world and, and building a successful global company. Brand is a relationship. It, it's as far as I'm concerned, the way I think of it is it's, it's far beyond marketing. It's every single thing that you do from how you recruit your employees to how you sell yourself to your customer support, to the experience of your app. Brand is dynamic. It, it's a real relationship and it's constantly redefined and it's only as good as the last encounter. So I'm part of a team at Olive um, fondly called Urika, um, which is what everyone started yeah. calling my colleague Uri R and myself. Hence Urika, like Eureka. Um, Uri is our experience and brand strategist at Olive. He's been leading global and creative product teams for 30 years. He's an expert on product strategy, design, and user experience. And he's just a creative genius. Um, so he and I joined Olive almost around the same time. And we saw the great need that our startups have for help with building their brands. So we combined our unique backgrounds and experience to create a process or, or methodology um, to help our companies create a compelling and sustainable brand strategy and infuse their story and their values into everything that they do. Okay, and, and I assume this, uh, we'll get into the approach and, and, and what it, the breakdown of it, but the, the, ha the fact that it's, it's flexible enough and adaptable as the company grows at the end of the day, like they need that strong, strong basis and then they have to adapt it. Um, so let's 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 talk a little bit about the approach. What are the stages? How do founders need to actually look and build the strategy? Okay, so our approach to building a, a brand strategy focuses on three main elements: your brand story, your brand values, and your people. You know, people call them the, your personas, right? So the brand story explains what you do, your mission, your values tell you how you go about achieving that mission, and your people are your audiences, the people that you're speaking to or building this for. And the basis of any interaction, any relationship between entities is understanding who you are, who you're talking to, how you wanna to talk to them, how you wanna build that connection. This is the foundation of building your brand. So um, I'll, I'll talk about all three elements uh, individually. So I'll start with your brand story. Um, the brand story is it's the basis for your company's communication with anybody and everybody. It explains who you are and why anybody should care that you exist, that you're here. Um, quite literally, it's a number of uh, very carefully crafted sentences that will serve as a benchmark for everything else that you do from your elevator pitch to constructing your entire messaging strategy. Um, and actually, you know, when founders come to us, um, 
often the first thing we'll say to them is, okay, so tell us about your company. And it's really hard for them to tell us right, about their company. Understand. It's hard for them. You know, we could be 20 minutes in and we're still like, wait, so what do you do? What do you do? So, like, so understand it's technical that like, no, no, what do you do? Exactly. So it's something that a lot of people are struggling with and understanding how to tell your story is, is, is critical. Um, so we structured the story around the fundamentals of storytelling, which uh, I learned about back in journalism 101 a million years ago at NYU. Um, the five W's, um, the basics of any story, who, what, where, when, why, and how. So um, why is like, why do you need to exist? Why should anyone care? Why you? We always try to start the story with emotional appeal. Um, and then you have where and when. That's like the context, giving the context, setting the stage, like where is this universe existing? Where is this neighborhood? Um, then what, what is it that you do? What's the bottom line? Like what tachlis do you do? Explaining your value proposition in one clear sentence that includes the logical rationalization for using your product or service. Then we have how, how are you different? Explain your differentiator, talk about it in a way that makes people understand why this is important. What claim can you make that the audience cares about that none of your competitors can make? You know, as we say it all up, different is better than better. Um, and then who do you have a relationship with? That's the who, who are your validators? Um, who are your, you know, brand name clients or investors or, you know, the founder's background of giving us, you know, the validating stamps of why we should trust you. Uh, and then we end on a gumdrop, as we call it, which is like a tagline, you know, something that hints at the company's personality and leaves a positive taste in your mouth. So we use this information to carefully and thoughtfully construct a brand story. That's the basis for all your communication. Um, and, you know, we kind of view it as like a body that you're going to dress up differently, depending on who you're talking to, your investor, your customers, your partners, your employees, whoever it is. So that's kind of like step one in our mind, the brand story. Um, uh, the second element that we focus on is your brand values. So brand values are everything. Um, I, I'm obsessed with values, okay? Um, I love them. Company values can often be really misunderstood. Um, sometimes they are perceived as cliched fluff, um, but they're actually super important. Um, I really believe that clearly articulating your values is much more meaningful than just randomly choosing a bunch of buzzwords like innovative and empowering and human, whatever these buzzwords are now, that you're gonna hang on the wall of your office. Right. They, they're words that you truly live by. These values determine your actions as a company, how you achieve your mission, and they guide your relationship with your audience. You know, they represent a commitment and a promise, and they also serve as heuristic. You know, they, they, they're what you use to measure before you have any data by which to measure. You know, um, should we create this feature? Should we do this? Well, is it in line with our values? In this campaign, were we this? Were we that? Were we in line with our values? And when we work on values, we don't just like name these words. We explain what we mean by them and what they mean for our work. You know, we're not just going to say bold or collaborative. We're going to include a sentence or a few words about what we mean by this, because values need to be clearly understood by everyone who's part of this company. And they need to know how to use them and how to, how to have them guide them in their work. Um, so your values should really serve as touchstones by which you measure everything and anything that you do to make sure it's really you and that it delivers on your commitment. So that's the second part. And then the third part is your people, um, right? This is a process of identifying your audiences. Who are you talking to? Who are your consumers? Who are your secondary audiences who can't be ignored or alienated? In, in order to create the right product or the right messaging, you need to understand who you're building it for and who you're talking to and understand the context and the scenario in which your audience is encountering your brand and interacting with it, um, where we meet them, their state of mind. So this is not a flat or superficial process. It's not similar to doing personas based on demographics. You know, we're not looking for um, you know, white males um, between the ages of 50 and 70 who live in urban areas. Um, it's an in-depth defining of audience groups based on roles and behaviors and their relationship with the brand. Um, and, and, and we're going to try and define a number of different things for each of our audience groups. So we want to understand what are their wants, needs, habits, and concerns? What are their expectations? Um, we want to understand the context and scenario, as I said, where we meet them. We want to define clearly what we do for them. What is it that we're doing for each specific audience? How are we making this audience think and feel about themselves? How do we make them uh, feel about us, about our brand with every interaction that they have with us? 
Uh, what do we make them think? You know, what's their rational reasoning when they think about us? And then finally, what can they consistently expect from us? What is our promise to them? You know, where are our red lines? And this information then serves as a measuring stick almost for anything that we do for them, whether it's a new marketing campaign or website messaging or developing a feature, because it guides us in applying our values and telling our story in a way that's relevant for our audience. I'm gonna wake up the founder that they're gonna to have to know these five, uh, these five uh, 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 story for bullets. I think that's a must for every Israeli founder, especially, especially founders in Israel because they come from such a tech background and their whole mindset is so tech, which is amazing because we don't have that anywhere else, but um, they also need to look a little bit outside the box when it comes to branding uh, uh, and, and telling their story. There's a whole aspect of employer brand branding when it comes to building your brand as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just want to say about what you just said. That's really interesting, Yael, because I think also our viewpoint as VCs is super important because we are outside. We're not internal at the company. We're not, you know, absorbed in the day to day of the company life. We are external and we see all the companies and we see so many things that are going on. And, and that's, you know, even though we're not in the, the day to day trenches of the company, we can give that external perspective, which can sometimes be really helpful. Um, but yeah, so in terms of implementing this, yeah, one of the ways we would implement this brand strategy is building an employer brand, right? So you, when you have your story and your values and your people, that's what we call a brand strategy. And we use it to build any number of things. So we could use that to build a communication guide where we then define the personality and the voice of the brand. We could use it to build a product strategy, a content strategy, and an employer brand. So employer brand specifically, um, I think it's, it's great that you mentioned it because it's another area where we identified a huge need in the market as companies are really competing over talent. Um, why should you, um, as a senior developer or engineer or marketer or whatever your role is, work at this startup versus this startup versus this startup? You know, how can you differentiate uh, yourself as a place to work in this huge market of all these startups? And so we use the same methodology to help our companies build an employer brand, which is an essential process of applying your brand story and your values to everything you do, from hiring and firing to company life. It's very tempting, and, and we see this everywhere, to try to build an employer brand by focusing on things like yoga classes and happy hours and ping pong tables in the office, but it, it really doesn't differentiate you. Everyone else is already doing this, and it's unlikely to be a meaningful expression of your values. So your employer brand differentiates you based on your value proposition to your employees, beyond all the basic elements that they've come to expect from a tech company, you know, all the, comp the compensation, the perks, the benefits, the attendees, right. to the things that they actually care about, like impact, making a difference, the mission that the company is on, their personal development, their professional development. So we use our brand strategy, our story, our values to help our companies build an employer brand that is going to guide all the aspects of their employee life cycle from when they're hired to onboarding to culture and welfare to termination. And I think to also where, when they sell it, you know, forward, you know, in whatever the role they do, um, which is which is something which is super important that everyone has to be in line when it comes to the branding. We'll discuss that a little bit later where it can't just be, you know, the CEOs and then the marketing and the sales. Everyone has to know exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it kind of brings me to my next point, because we're talking a lot about early stage and, you know, companies that have just raised seed. Um, but I want to, I want I would like you to tell me a little bit more about companies, tell us more about companies, you know, post A round um, and the difference with working with companies, which have raised a little bit more, or have done a little bit of branding in the beginning. And we're at a later stage now. So let's, I'd like to discuss that a bit because we also work with companies which are post A uh, and et cetera. Yeah, so Olive um, invests in early stage companies. So we're talking seed stage, A round, but our startups have of course grown significantly. Um, and we've done this type of work when a company is just a couple of founders, literally just two founders. And we've also, or even one founder as the case may be. And we've also done it with bigger teams, um, but there is such an advantage to doing it early and building everything consciously and thoughtfully in line with your brand from the very beginning. Um, you know, the basic groundwork I think that you need to lay is the same no matter what stage your company is in. You need to understand your audiences. You need to understand your value proposition, the story that you're telling, you know, defining your values and then understanding how they're guiding you. But in later stage companies, there are so many more resources and so many more opportunities to actually implement this brand. 
They have bigger teams. They've got more money. They're often already doing PR and social media strategy and a content strategy. And for sure, they're doing employer branding because they're much bigger companies and they're hiring like crazy. So it can be even more challenging to make sure everything's aligned to the same story and everything's aligned with your values. And also, it's even more important to do so. Um, I, I know that a lot of people think that branding is something that can wait till later on. It's not a priority um, often in the beginning. But I, I want to say one critical thing. Um, branding is not marketing. Branding is everything that you do. It's how you hire and who you hire. It's how you interact with your customers and the experiences that you create for them. It's your product. It's what your engineering team prioritizes. And of course, it's also how you communicate and it's the look and feel, but it's a relationship. And that relationship starts being built very early on. So you have a brand, whether you control it or not, whether you invest time and money into it is, is up to you. No, I think that's, that's, on, that's on point. It's all about sustainability. And, and, and again, I think we need a lot of founders where they think branding is, you know, just doing a website and materials. And, and, and that's not what it is. It's really knowing your story. And as you said, I, I think I know that we discussed a lot of employer branding here because there's such a strong aspect here. It's not about how you just tell how you bring on customers or investors. It, it's really how you also that your employers understand the story and understand your branding and your values. Because at the end of the day, they're the people who are bringing in the customers, doing the sale, you know, talking about the company outside, bringing in their friends. Um, and I, I think especially today where there's so much competition um, over talent, if a company does branding the right way, I think it will you know, take them that extra step um, when it comes to employer branding. Um, I, I wanna discuss Israel because it's a very, uh, it's an amazing market. It's also complex. What, what are the biggest challenges you found when you work with Israeli founders? Um, so uh, I think first of all, it's founders in general need to understand um, the value of branding and storytelling. They, and, and also they need to have the time to really invest in this work. You know, they're understandably quite busy people um, and it's deep work that takes time and money and it's got to come from the founding team. Um, I never dictate anything to our companies or to our entrepreneurs. You know, I'm here to um, advise and, and help and guide, but it's their company. And I will never pretend that I know this company better than, than its founders. Of course not. I'm, I'm here to help. Um, I think it's also a challenge to make this work sustainable. Because at the end of the day, I don't work at any of these companies. I work at Olive. Um, I don't stay on at any of these companies. You know, I move on to the next company and I want to make sure I don't leave a giant hole when I leave. Um, I need to make sure that the work is sustainable. I need, they need to understand how to take the work forward on their own. And I need to make sure they have the team, um, the necessary team internally to do so. Um, so I think these are challenges that, that are really just face all founders and all companies um, when, you, when you're taking this approach. I agree. Um, I'd be happy if you could maybe share, um, you know, one or two stories or one or two companies so that we can actually see um, like different, you know, brand strategies that you did with them. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll talk to you first uh, about Compete. Um, that's a, a great recent example of a company that we worked with. Um, they're a startup in the HR space. They're one of Olive's portfolio companies. Um, they were actually originally called Piplewise when they first joined the Olive portfolio and we started working with them. So after we completed our brand strategy work with them, we also did a naming workshop based on that brand strategy, taking their story, their values, their people, just as we discussed earlier, into consideration, and we helped them rename to Compete which is awesome uh, because in this world where talent is everything, recruitment is such a challenge for startups and growing your team is really key to growing your company. They actually help tech companies compete by giving them an unfair advantage, you know, like immediate insights into complete compensation package data. And also compete holds the word comp in, in, in within it, right? Mm -hmm. um, they help you gain a clear view of your company's employee compensation and benefits benchmarks compared to the market. So I'll tell you a little bit about them. Um, Compete is a super easy to use SaaS solution, uniquely built by HR professionals for HR. It provides um, real-time data and instant analysis with very advanced filtering capabilities at the click of a button, and they're tailored for tech companies. 
Right. He worked very closely with the founders um, who are also husband and wife, Amit Rappaport and Yoni Wasserman. Uh, I love you guys. You know that. Um, <laughs> I met them today. They're amazing. They're amazing. <laughs> they're great. So shout amazing. out um, from me. Um, they're super intelligent. They're experienced. They're so passionate, so enthusiastic about this. There's nothing more fun than working with a team like that. And along with their, with their uh, VP marketing, Rafi, who worked with as well, to go through this process together. Um, of building a brand strategy with us leading and advising, but really helping them to build a compelling and sustainable brand strategy that's guiding everything they do as a company from their comms and their messaging to product to customer support to their design and their visual guide from very early on, right? Building that story, building out and defining their values, uh, uh, defining all of their personas. And, and they already have hundreds of clients, like Apps, Fire, Lemonade, Fiverr. Um, you, you can check them out on competewith.com. I'll um, I'll share my screen for a second. Um, and as we speak, Nir just joined. Hi, Nir. Hi, hey. Nir. Hey, Ayel. Hey, Erica. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Nir, uh, Erica just joined us uh, an example and uh, another, uh, she's just joined us two big examples of what she worked with and then we'll get into the second part of the session. Uh, we, yeah. we really so, like to see the work you've done. So I, this thought, is, I thought it's live. I was into the tens. It's live. We're live. Ah, okay. <laughs> that well, video one shot. Shot. Yeah, it's only one shot. We only do one shot for the other. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's great to meet you, Nir. I was just telling um, Yael about um, one of our, the portfolio companies that we recently worked with, Compete, who I love, um, on building their brand strategy. And this is this is their website. As you can see, some of these messages right on the front of their website are straight from the brand strategy that we built. Talent is everything. Compete with an unfair advantage. How can we use our name and use our values of being bold to to to, to really attract our clientele? Right. Um. Another. Touched on a lot of important points here, and 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 I think. The most important point is when, when we speak to founders and founders who, you know, maybe haven't even raised seed yet, or, and they still want to do this, they, they still want to do this. They need to remember the few rules of, like you said, story, value, people, uh, and they can do this on their own. Okay. Yes. It's always great to have someone that helps you with it. Someone from a branding or, or someone from a marketing background, or it doesn't, you know, someone, you know, or can help you. But at the end of the day, founders need to do this exercise for them. Um, to begin that journey of building their story for the company. Um, and I think it's something that will stick with them throughout their whole journey. As you said, they'll use it. It needs to be flexible and change over time, but they need to have that basis. Um, and I think that's something founders really need to focus on when they start their company. Even when, as I say, when they're in the garage, garage stage, that's when they need to start thinking about it. Um, so thank you so much for uh, amazing input. And I think that uh, whoever watches this, and I will write a summary at the end, We'll definitely learn a lot. Um, as we do for the second part of the session, we brought on that. We bring in one of our, our portfolio companies. So, so Cedric, Nir, you're going to tell us all about Cedric in a minute. Um, they're one of our newer portfolio companies at stage one. Um, and, and, and I love working with Nir, but I, the reason we brought Nir on is because they also just did a, a, a branding a, a branding process in the company. So I thought it would be good for him to ask questions uh, um, from his point of view. Um, and someone who's just gone through that uh, uh, whole process as well. Um, so Nir, I would be great if you could tell us a little about like in three, four lines about Cedric, about yourself, and then jump into the questions directly. And Eric is here yeah. to answer. Sounds good, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so really briefly about myself, uh, my name is Nir. I'm an information system engineer. I'm married to Ossie, and I'm a father to two little ninjas at the ages of uh, four and two and a half years old. Um, about 18 months ago, I partnered with one of the nicest people in Israel, which has happened to be one of the most talented data scientists. And together we've built, we started to build Cedric. And Cedric at the end of the day is a risk management and compliance excellence platform that was designed for the next gen of fintechs. fintechs. We've realized that uh, the fintechs the fintech is taking over and it's a totally different organization than the traditional financial services firms. They have different requirements, especially when it comes to branding, branding but under the hood at the end of the day, this is a heavy and a complex operation that needs to comply with very complex requirements from regulator, 
uh, from consumer uh, con consumer protection perspectives and data privacy. So we have them uh, in their uh, expedited growth uh, to protect their brand, but also not to break anything due uh, during that uh, that mission. So uh, yeah, we we've started. Um, selling the product really quickly uh, by identifying the pain. And I think that one of the challenges that we faced is that we sold a slightly different value proposition for each customer. And you can do that as part of a sale process, but then we needed to think of a narrative that would incubate all those value propositions into one. And that was the marketing process, which was quite challenging at the beginning. I think that one of the greatest lessons learned for me was that you don't need to try and capture the world all at once. You need to focus to find your audience and start from there. So we did that, but obviously it's just the beginning. Um, and I think that like every other project, we're always reflecting, thinking what we could have done better. And uh, I'd love to, to share a few questions if you can uh, you know, help me get some tips and tricks I'll what? try. I'll be happy to try. <laughs> Perfect. So as I said, at the beginning, we sold slightly different value propositions for the different clients. So obviously, I'm, what I'm trying to ask is how agile can you be when you build a, a new branding narrative? Okay. So uh, I think you can be agile when you're building a brand narrative, you know, unlike with your values, where your values, the part of your brand strategy, these, these are, these are going to largely remain the same, right? Because these are foundations for guiding your strategy. And if your values change drastically, then it would mean a drastic change for your company's strategy or direction or real pivot. But with your story, I think you definitely need to be flexible here, especially when it's very early on, because your company is going to grow and you're going to build new products. You're going to build new features that are, that are going to come out. And when you're building that brand story, it's important from the get go, not only to look at where your company is today and what practically you're offering today, but also where you're going. What, what is the vision? What is the mission that's going to be be going to be a common thread from today to tomorrow to next year, and then creating that kind of overarching narrative. And it, you, you do need to find the balance between what is practical of where you are today and what you're offering today, um, because it needs to be believable and true, right? But also taking into account where you're going and what is that big picture. And, and this can be adapted as you grow and build, constantly reflecting your customer needs, but should still stay, you know, reflect and stay true to your original mission. I think that the challenge that I see in uh, finding that narrative is that you're trying to optimize sometimes uh, the narrative for very different audiences. And the way I see it and analyze the map, we're trying to optimize the employer branding from one hand, and then we have the narratives that we want to nurture in front of the investors and the bigger stories that we are after. And there's there is sales. I mean, customers, they care about the vision, but sometimes they care about the value proposition, which is more clear, more simple. How can you navigate between those uh, different stakeholders that uh, sometimes do not overlap? Okay, so I think that a brand story, um, it's its really not, it's not a copy paste thing, right? The, the only place that you're going to probably copy paste that story is maybe your about page on your website, right? Or at the bottom of a press release or something. But it is the basis for all of your communications. You know, the way that we view it, as I said earlier, it's, it's, it's kind of like a body, this story. And you're going to dress it up slightly differently depending on who you're speaking to, whether that's your investors or potential clients or employees or potential employees. You know, there might be some messages in that story that you're going to use for your web copy. And there'll be other messages that you use for sales emails. And when you're building an investor deck, you know, for your round A, you might run a, you might, you know, run that story like a thread throughout the deck, peppering here and there with different messages so that at the end of the deck, you've overall told, that, you know, you've, yeah, you've shown them your competitive analysis and, you know, your total available market and blah, blah, blah. But you've also told them this story of the company of what you guys are doing here. And, you know, for the homepage, you know, you might structure it your, your homepage of your website, utilizing the same structure of the story, you know, starting with that emotional appeal, the why, getting into the background, what is, what is it that you do, right, et cetera, in this kind of structure as you're scrolling down and building that out. Whereas for a job, you know, a job ad, for example, 
you might just want to use me one message depending on who that audience is. Right. So how do you actually balance between those different needs? I mean, if I get what you're saying, um, you're recommending us like to identify which is, who is the st stakeholder for each initiative. And let's say if it's the homepage, so we should target it for the users is uh, from the sales perspective. And when it comes to the deck, just to emphasize sometimes totally different messaging I'm not sure that I would say totally different. I think that you, first of all, for sure need to have in mind who you're creating something for. Your audience is always the starting point, you know, for telling a story is who, who am I doing this for? And that's the starting point. And then it's kind of more adapting and adjusting and tweaking for the story that, that's appropriate for them. So it is, you know, the same. It's not like all of a sudden you're, you know, for these people, you're going to be talking about fintech and for these people, you're going to be talking about, I don't know, you know, music or something. You're, you're, you're still talking about your same story and the value proposition you're giving, but it's looking at it from a slightly different perspective that's relevant for that audience. And I think specifically, you know, you mentioned employer branding. When you're talking about those needs between internal and external audiences, right? Um, it's super important that you're taking all these audiences into consideration when you're building your brand, right? When you're when when you're doing that uh, that initial brand building. Um, so that's all your customers and client personas, as well as your employees, because initially your employees are going to be the ambassadors of your brand. These are the people who need to understand it. They need to carry it. They need to implement it whether that's salespeople or customer success or marketers or developers, they need to be on board and they need to understand this overall brand, how they um, infuse it into their work. And this is gonna be the basis for building your employer brand, which is then taking your story, your brand story, your, your brand values and applying it to everything that you do from hiring and firing to company life. And your employer brand is defined by how outsiders and potential employees perceive your company as a workplace and by how your actual employees um, feel and experience your company and express that then to others, right? So for example, when we're, when we're defining our values as a company, we're not defining values, um, well, these are the values for our external clients and these are the values for in internally for our employees. We take our values, whatever they are, and that is what they are. And, and we understand how to translate or apply them internally as well as externally. So, so for example, let's say we have a value as a company. Our, one of our brand values is collaborate, okay? Or collaborative, right? Which is a, a very popular one. So externally for our customers, this might mean we open conversations and we help them build dialogue or align interests and strengthen team relationships. Internally, this would mean that we also value collaboration and we encourage our teams to work together towards the best possible outcome. Yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. Now, if I may, one last question. I, I always try to make sense, Mir. At the very <laughs> least. We all are. We all are. It's, it's sometimes I don't always hard. succeed, but I try. <laughs> <laughs> so in the past two months, we've been working very hard on uh, getting all those insights in one place, getting the best masterminds, including Yael, uh, to find that clear narrative that uh, is going to serve us. We developed a totally new brand that will communicate those values that we developed and purify. And uh, I'm happy to, to share that uh, we came out of stealth last week with a fancy uh, press release campaign that was picked up by over 200 publishers all over the world. So it was all great, but we all understand that the work, the real work only starts. How can we maintain this uh, brand consistency now after the rebrand campaign was completed? Okay, so I have a lot to say about this. This is a really good question. Um, everyone, you know, after a rebrand, everyone in the company needs to be aware and on board and on the same page. And this is obviously a little bit easier when a company is, company is smaller and a lot harder when the company is larger. Mm -hmm. There are, of course, practical things that you need to do, you know, like archiving the old materials within the company and, and, and also possibly externally as well, by the way. So, for example, investors, right, you're going to want to make sure that stage one has your new logos and your new one liner, right, for when they're passing that around. And it's you need to make on the website. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you'd be surprised though how many times that's a forgotten audience, right, right. when someone's doing a rebrand. Let's make sure our clients know. But you know, your investors might still be sending out your old material. 
Um, and you obviously need to make sure that everyone had everyone within the company has access to the brand guidelines that they're clear they're easy to understand they're thorough they're easily accessible for every employee. But I think there's also a broader way of thinking about this as well, you know it's much more than here's the new logo delete the old one and only use this, you know we want everybody. Uh, internally to be on board with this and to be excited about it, we want them to understand why we did it and we want them to understand what the implications are. You know, as I said earlier, uh, the employees are the ambassadors of our brand. Uh, a brand is a relationship, and that relationship is being formed across tons of different touch points, from marketing to sales to customer support, and it's only as good as wherever that last encounter is. So we really need everybody to be a part of this, it, you know? And maybe we have a kickoff event, right? So we had a company, actually, Centrical, that they had, they did a great rebrand, and they had week-long activities after this huge rebrand, including fun swag and skits and things that made it enjoyable and memorable and engaging for all of their employees and of course making sure that everyone had access to all the new materials um, and I think finally I think it's also about um, having a change in thinking uh, everything that we do now needs to start from that brand strategy from the stories we define from, from the story we define from the values we define to the personas that we define every piece of messaging that we work on for example, it needs to use this as a starting point. So let's say that you're redoing your website. Let's say you're creating a new piece of messaging or a new creative or a video or a script, whatever it is. The copy should stem from that brand story. It should reflect the mission. Thoughtful, conscious thinking needs to be done on whatever we're doing, You know, it, whether it's a new feature. And we ask ourselves, is this really us now? Does this reflect our values? Can we commit to this? Does this represent our promise to our customers? Is this telling our story? And this constantly needs to be kept in mind and everything that we're working on across the board of the company until it becomes a habit for everybody. Very true. Very true. Thanks for that. We'll try to implement it as much as we can. <laughs> you guys, you don't, I don't think you understand. Nair is like one of the most amazing people to work for. I mean, he is one of those founders, which is like, but that's amazing. Eli Milim Kilu. <laughs> I'll yeah, push it forward and, 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 and he always thinks outside the box and it's very profound and we saw when we when he did this rebranding process as well branding process um that looking back at everything you discussed Eric and we'll write it that they also went through a lot of these stages and I think it's super important um I think it was very very useful and and, and a great session I, I really want to thank you both for your time here I know you're super super busy Eric I know you're super super busy um, so I really appreciate the fact that you guys took time uh, to share uh, your knowledge and, and, and your experience um, with other founders, which I, I assume we're going to get a lot from listening to you guys and, and, and reading. And, um, and, and thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Yael, for, for asking me uh, here. And thank you, Nir, for asking me for my advice. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it. <laughs> Have a great Thank day, guys, and then we'll see you for the next marketing session, um, which will be- Let's do the next one face-to-face. -face. We will, we will, we will do the next one face-to-face. -face. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay, Bye. have a good one. Bye. Bye.